one way or another. Hey, folks. The, the dogs are barking. The dogs are barking for us. They're calling for me. The hound is the uh, hound is the bed styville. How's that? Is that good? <clears throat> the hound of the bed styles. Uh, Paul. Come on, fuck you. That was pretty good. That was some good stuff. Yeah, perfect timing. This dog just started as soon as I did. I think he is honestly responding to my voice. Maybe he's telling me to pipe down. Maybe he's telling me to shut my trap. And if he is, he's probably right too. Uh, yeah, I'm just feeling a little shaky. Not feeling as centered as I have recently. I'm trying to, I'll find my way back. I'm not too worried about it, just being in front. Thought I would do a nice chill stream this time, a real one. Answer some questions and just maybe have a back and forth. This would have been a good day to go to the office, maybe, but man, I don't know. I think we might be shutting back down again here very shortly. I wouldn't be surprised if within a week there's another, some attempt at a, at a lockdown. It's a bummer, man. It's a real bummer. Low audio. Ah, hell. Got the thing turned up as much as I can. I put up the volume. I could speak louder also. Muffled? Oh, God damn it. Ah. Okay, so how's that sound? If that doesn't sound good, I can get the microphone, because I have the mic. So how's this? Better? Okay. Always off to a good start with audio issues, my favorite thing. I love being on the ones and twos while trying to figure out what the hell I'm talking about. My favorite thing in the world. I love having inability. Yeah, no, it's my own fault though. You know, uh, I would if I really cared, I would do a better job. <coughs> well, I'm sorry that I haven't done better. Honestly, it still sounds muffled. I'm sorry. Shit. You know what? You guys got to hold me accountable. I agree. You guys have to hold me accountable. I need to be held accountable. I think that I need to understand that I need to do better. And that if I don't, then I need to be held accountable. I understand that. I could use a gamer chair, not gonna lie. Oh, I mean, no, I absolutely could not use a gamer chair. It would be a sin to have a gamer chair, but I certainly imagine rocking back and forth in custom contoured comfort. But yeah, no, that would be the devil. That would be the devil getting me that. Like the devil would give me a gamer chair and have me survey, you know, uh, survey the online and go, here, this can be yours. No, no. Back, Satan. Get thee behind me. Get thee behind me, Satan. Some things covering the mic. Oh, boy. Ah, uh, muffled mic. Ah, oh, Christ. Ah, uh, hell. All right, I might have to go get the uh, the microphone, which is apparently, uh, it doesn't record as high for the YouTube, so that's why I tried to use this cord, but the cord doesn't seem to be working. This has got to be the single worst content you can find on the internet, is me trying to fucking fix this like a goddamn boomer. Like trying to get talked through tech support by someone, by my bored nephew. It really does tell you like how tightly people are wound by whether they say it's good or not, because obviously something is wrong, and obviously it's not so bad that it's unlistenable. It comes down to how much it bothers you. So if you say it's fine, it means you're not noticing it. If you say it isn't fine, then it means that you're noticing it. 
So some balance between, you know, wanting to hear my words and not wanting to hear them in a way that like challenges you to hear it or something, I don't know, or challenges like some aesthetic assumption about how you think it should sound. And that really just seems like an issue that you just, it's like, I'm sorry, and tonight, I, today I guess I'm not worth listening to rather than being annoyed by it. And yeah, it probably also depends on how good your computer is and how good your headphones are and all that. But I can't control those things. Yes, it's fine that it's not fine. I have to remember my, my I have to remind myself that. The universe will unfold as it should. All right, you know what? I, I'm gonna still. Oh, I want to get the. I get the microphone just to see if it works. All right. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get over this. We'll see. This is a challenge for me now. To like. To like accept the things I cannot change. Because realistically, I'm not gonna be able to do anything about it. Yes, maybe I should be uncomfortable tonight. Maybe maybe I have to have a thorn in my saddle for some reason. It'll, maybe I need to be agitated. I don't know. Right now it just feels agitated. It doesn't really feel uh, productive. But that's why we play the games. That's why we play the games, folks. Oh, now they're mad at me for not getting the mic. I just, I didn't want to step away from it. It seems like it's kind of bad, you know bad form. All right, you know what? I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Yang greats. Let me fucking try this. God damn it. Who signed up for Grandpa Simpson's computer repair? God, tell me that sounds better. For the love of criminy, tell me that sounds better. Oh, thank God. All right. Fine. I guess I can't use the cord anymore. Apologies for the YouTube people. Hopefully it'll be loud enough. I'm trying. I swear to God, I'm trying. I'll ask Chris maybe to take a look at it. I want the people to be able to access the content. I understand that the content must flow above all, that it is our very anima, that it is our spice melange. I understand that, and I will never not facilitate the flow. I will never allow the flow to be uh, in any way uh, critically interrupted. I did not see Alex Jones's speech. I'm assuming he said some shit about overthrowing the government or whatever. Uh, not worried about it. Yep, yeah, baby, I've entered the rant zone. Entering the rat zone. Squiddly doo. Squiddly doo. Lenin was a great orator. Trotsky was the best, though. Trotsky was the greatest orator of the old Bol of the Bolsheviks. He got him spellbound. 
He first did it in 1905 when he was a kid. He got brought in and ended up heading the Petrograd Soviet purely on his or 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 oratical skills. However, you want to whatever uh, oratorical. That's it. God, oratorical skills. And then he was the most spellbinding speaker at the. Uh, uh, what the fuck's it called? And he got everybody, uh, and he ended up drawing the blueprint, really, for the whole damn thing. Tactically and strategically, really. It was more, it was more his idea than it was Lenin's, I think. But Lenin was the one who, you know, directed it. And the one who gave it the actual, uh, uh, like, operating system. Couldn't have had one without the other. But Lenin was pretty, he was, on the stump he was pretty big. Him showing back up, him showing back up uh, in, in, at, the, at the Finland station was, was a historical thunderbolt because the Bolsheviks until that point really were terrified of the prospect of taking power. Because they kind of knew they didn't have the the authority to do that. In that, like, yeah, they 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 represented a, a, a like absolute huge majority of you know bullsh of of, of Saint Petersburg workers. But what did that mean in the whole you know the terms of the entire Russian Empire? It was a terrifying prospect, and they kind of wanted to lean back. That was their instinct anyway. And Lenin was the one who stepped into the breach and said, no, no, this is not a stable equilibrium. This will collapse one way or the other, and we have to choose which way it's going to go, by which, which, which direction we push our shoulders to. Uh, because, and I think that was true. I really do think. Like, I don't think there's any world where the, uh, the, the provisional government survives into some sort of bourgeois democracy. It would have collapsed, most likely taken over in some sort of military coup. And given those op options, you cannot blame anybody. Uh, in fact, I, I think you'd have to say that the only moral action is to try to seek power in that context. That abdicating power is abdicating responsibility and, and in fact, making yourself responsible for horrors to come that you could have stopped. But, you know, it creates new situations that you can't anticipate. Federalism should have been ended in 1865. The federalist system was tried and found wanting, or rather it was destroyed by, by might. I mean, it was, it was extinguished as a, uh, as a real basis for sovereignty. Because when, it, when, it, when, it, when, when they break into pieces, the greater half will absorb the other half. We know that now. So there is no real source of power there other than to just create a temporary disequilibrium and waste resources and waste time. And more than anything, gum up the progress of, you know, creating a, 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 a political structure that can actually like respond to conditions. And that probably would have, you know, it's hard to say we ever would have gotten rid of it, but should means nothing. We kept it because it was useful, and it has always been useful, but I think it should, it'll have to go. It'll have to go. Can't imagine it not going. Any, any realistic, even medium-term uh, play for power in America would not be constitutional, I think. And, or rather, it could be constitutionally pursued, but in power would negate the Constitution as, as part of their mandate. White Claw Lime is the worst flavor. It's the only one I had left, though, sadly. These are the, these are the struggles of those of us in the COVID plague years, stuck with the worst of the, of the, of the hard seltzers. Lime is a great flavor in many contexts, but for some reason in the alcoholic 
seltzer business. And honestly, even the non-alcoholic seltzer business, it seems to be an inferior flavor to many others. All berries are better than lime, I would say. So he said that if Trotsky were alive now, he would be on Substack. That is 100% correct. Because if you think about it, when you look at the origin of, you know, like the modern, the modern like policy intelligentsia, the modern like political wonk class, you know, the people who write for, the, the public intellectuals, the people who write for, you know, uh, uh, name brand uh, institutional think organizations, not necessarily famous people, but people who are known within among people who are inside, you know, the bubble, the people like the people who take them seriously. They, um, they are, they were largely Trotskyites. They were largely people who came out of the 30 split as Trotskyites. And then in, uh, in the post sixties disillusionment era turned into neoconservatives. They set the mold. Like every, uh, every op-ed columnist is a Trotskyite at heart. And so everybody who ends up eventually quitting their org because they, you know, want to be oppressed to justify why they're not being listened to more or why they're not more popular, and then finds themselves with only the market to blame as they put their wares onto the street. back on and back on the content must flow like i said nothing will stop it neither sleep nor sh snow nor dark of night shall keep me from my appointed content rounds i shall always be here i shall always be here mining the content M taking the content from the mines panning it molding it flattening it stacking it into bricks transporting it across mountain passes Exchanging it for various uh, Eastern silks and uh, spices and sumptuaries. I lost a bunch of viewers there. That was bad. That was bad work. Sorry, I had a I had a thing. Hopefully they'll come back, but if they don't, that's fine. This already feels kind of like a cursed chat with all that uh, damn uh, audio problems early on. I've actually thought, somebody's asking about the 30 Years War. I've actually thought about doing a project, like a podcast project about the 30 Years War because it's wildly interesting, and I don't really think that there is a very, you know, there's a single sort of agreed upon uh, coverage of it. Like Patrick Wyman was going to get to the 30 years war, but he basically, he did so much early modern that he kind of got sick of it, which I understand, you know. You get sick of the Habsburgs after a while. He was just describing how their jaws just got farther and farther and farther out of their mouths. But it's got a lot of early, very interesting stuff. The way that you know religion operated in that early uh, Reformation period, and the spread of uh, early spread of media, how that contributed to the whole thing, which is pretty interesting. I'd really like to talk a little bit more about the Swedes. The Swedes are fascinating to me, that they were a uh, continent bestriding military colossus there for a bit under old Gustavus Adolphus. I 
And then you've got things like the emergence of modern Realpolitik when Cardinal Richelieu had the French Bourbon uh, uh, throne support the Protestant League against Catholic Habsburg because they were the greater uh, secular threat to Bourbon rule. That was the ultimate don't play the, hate the player, hate the game move. Sorry, guys. You're not going to get away with me that easily. I'm back. Uh, this is, yes, on the third stream, he rose again. So this will be the last one, I think. One way or the other, when this one stops, I will be done. Thy will be done on Earth as it is uh, on Twitter. Am I right, folks? Somebody asked if one of the reasons that uh, the United States did not become socialist is because it was too secular. I think there's actually something to that because if you take secular to mean that you have replaced to that, so the degree that a society is secular is the degree to which you have replaced like uh, spiritual, non-marketized emotional connections between people with market relationships. Like in some places where capitalism is being imposed upon a well-structured social network, or if it emerges like in, in, in uh, it, it emerges out of class struggle, like in Europe, you get this suffusion of from the root uh, a a a in, uh, a spiritualized sense of the social obligation that can then interact with capitalism. Whereas in America, because we came in as as scattered shredded you know refuse of Europe uh, the mo uh, having been stripped of our social bonds completely having r new religious orders that resacralized you know our relationship to the land and our relationship to each other by essentially removing the social dimension altogether from life and replacing it with pure transactions and that's what we have tried to build a social conception on top of while we've been rapidly capitalizing and it's tough it's very difficult it's like you're trying to build a it's like you're trying to build a, a airplane while it's in the air and i'm not saying that those pre-capitalist modes were socialist they weren't they had to evolve into capitalism they but they couldn't skip directly to socialism because they were uh, peasant social relationships, which are not the social relationships of a uh, of a uh, like socialized subject who has gone through the process of like the contradictions within capitalism working themselves out. Someone keeps asking, why was John Brown insane? Which is a weird way of putting it instead of just saying, was he? Uh, and I guess it's a good way to put it because he was, if you accept the definition of insanity to be uh, uh, demanding like to the point of violence to insist on the world being a way that no one else recognizes it to be. Without like taking the hint of his social relationships to understand that what he thinks is real is not, you know. What he thinks is his connection to all humanity and his moral obligation to it is not real. And if that's the case, and you know, in the, in the modern secularized way, that is the only thing that insanity can be. Like, there is no underlying truth or falseness that's not, that doesn't come in, that doesn't enter into, 
So he was insane in that sense, but he was also right. And that tells you that there is a more complicated relationship between sanity and conceptions of sanity and the social order than it is presented to be. I'm not really liking the big good Lord Bird at all. Somebody said it was Hamilton with, uh, what they say, like Hamilton but violent, and that seems to be basically it. That's, I mean, I still haven't seen Hamilton, but it feels like that's correct. Hamilton with violence, and that is not very interesting to me. It's not, I'm not mad at it anymore, but it's just like, it's not even interesting. It's not even like doing enough to get a rise anymore. Somebody asking if the Mujahideen were a gladio unit. There is a, a, a thing that's like not officially part of the gladio operation, but it's sort of a conjecturized operation called Gladio B that basically says that the uh, invasion of, the, not even the Afga invasion of Afghanistan, the buildup to the, the rising of tensions within Afghanistan that led to the invasion was an operation that was essentially along the same lines where the like Afghan version of the you know lumpen mafia figures that they used in Europe uh, were similarly plied with drugs and money and given guns and let loose on a communist opponent. Uh, and there, it's the their parallels are striking. I mean, we were we had money and, and guns into the the resistance in Afghanistan before there even was a Soviet uh, invasion when it was just the communist government. We were explicitly trying to give them their own Vietnam, and we and it worked. I mean, like, like Zbigniew Brzezinski was very proud of it, and he famously said, "You know, I don't think you can compare the the liberation of uh, all of Eastern Europe to some riled up jihadis in the Middle East, because for him that was like what they got to do. They got to pay him back for Vietnam, and then also they fell. They then collapsed shortly after that, and really vindicated them." And, they felt like that's what matters, you know, a few 9-11s or whatever, and, you know, regimes and, and, like, fundamentalism taking over in more and more places and ratcheting up violence, that's all good for them. That's not blowback even. That's, that's interest. That's compound interest on an investment. Yeah, South Africa was a country that, as a country, was just a one giant gladio operation. They weren't even like the, the, the deep state. It was just the state. Because like Boss was if P2, like Boss was if P2 was a, a official state security branch.
Hey, what's going to happen with the damn Brexit? What's going on? Are they really just going to crash out? I thought this thing had already been like done three times already. I really don't understand. I don't really care, which is nice, because if I did, it'd be very frustrating. I'm just kind of curious. What is the deal? What's the tamuppets? What's the what's the bobs? What's the what's what's uh? Give me a butcher's. How do they keep having to keep this deal? How many times have they like? How many times have they said they had a deal and then what happened? Why did it not go forward? This is insane to me. So when does it happen? Is there actually a day? Is there actually a day where this shit happens as opposed to what has happened? It's like the election. It's just drawn out forever. It's been Brexit for five years. It's a drawn out. It's like an orgasm. It just can't. It's a ruined out orgasm. It's like our system. It feels like Brexit can't ever come. It's like Zeno's paradox. So you're really guys telling me. You guys are swearing like hard Brexit. They put up the fucking border back in Northern Ireland. The cu- troubles kick back off. That all happens on January 31st. No fooling. Or is it going to be like five, five, 500 other deadlines I heard about that pass with nothing changing? So tell me, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? Cursed Island, who cares, is the correct answer. Cursed Island, who cares? Hashtag, who care? Putting it on the Neverland list, especially since nobody can give me a straight answer about whether anything's ever going to happen over there that's going to be interesting enough to pay attention to. Because for now, it's all been Snoozeville. Although, if fucking Boris Johnson gets COVID again, that will be funny. Not going to lie. If he pulls a Bolsonaro and gets fucking COVID twice, that will be very funny. Hello, I'm Keith Starmer, isn't it? I'm Keith Bleeding Starmer, mate. I'm Bleeding Keith Starmer. Hello, I'm Sir Keith Starmer. I'm a knight. I'm a knight of the Bleeding Round Table, isn't I? Hello, I'm Keith Starmer, the knight of the Bleeding uh, Richard Spencer haircut. Hello, Tuppence a Pen. Oh, cheerio. What's this? I mean, what? how did that happen? I don't care. Never mind. Chief Keith Starmer, yes. It's a load of bullocks is what it is. It is a pedo island. We all know that. It's ruled by pretty explicit pedophiles. Jimmy Savile, we all remember that. Lord Mountbatten, whose assassination was just commemorated on the crown, famously longtime pedophile who apparently treated Northern Irish orphanages as his personal bordellos. A disgusting, depraved, sick piece of shit. And one of the high, what a high counselor and fucking direct relative, what, uncle of the queen? Vile. I mean, forgetting what he did to the fucking a partition to basically ensure it became a monstrous bloodbath. Swine. And then, of course, there's uh, all the revelations about Thatcher's cabinet and inner circle. And then Prince Andrew and Epstein. It's everywhere. So anyway, I, I wish good luck to the good people, the ones that exist, which is basically Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, in the UK, but everyone's going to have to tend to their own garden now, man. Let's see what we can come up with. Let's dig dirt. Let's get in the dirt. Let's get some worms. Let's roll around in the worms. Favorite Irish historical figure? That's an interesting question. Who do I like? Who do I like? Uh... I like, um, uh, Wolf Tone is, a, is like hardcore, like tried to gouge his own throat out. Uh, 
Daniel Collins or Daniel McConnell. I love the Monster Monster Mash, Monster Alley. But yeah, James Connolly, obviously, for the duh. Jim Larkin also. Richard Casement was a G. Not a big fan of uh Eamon De Valera. I think he's a creep. Uh, and uh and uh Patrick Pierce was kind of a find of a Looney Tune. Honestly, not in like an endearing, uh, I don't know if that's really in a John Brown way. It's, I don't know, creepy. And of course, the greatest Irishman of all time, uh, uh, Michael Rappaport, the greatest Irishman to ever live. Uh, Chris Wade is definitely on the good, on the Irish good books. Uh, he's a fine Irish lad. And Nor Nick Mullen, of course, also. One of the few good ones. I think Will. I think Will is actually Scotch Irish, and they do not count. I'm sorry, Scotch Irish don't count. Fuck off. Fuck out of here, hun. Get out of here, you Presbyterian psychos. You and Ian Paisley can fuck off. But uh, I would say that, like, I don't think that's even true in Ireland. Like, I don't think there needs to be some pogrom against Protestants. It's a pointless. It's, it's stupid. It's a remnant. But I do think that in America, demographically, they're a distinct group. Like, their culture was distinct. And they settled in distinct areas. Like, our, our uh, you know, the, our potato-eating patties, our, our good Catholic boys and girls, settled in America's, like, East Coast cities and, you know, settled into roles as, like, is, the, is essentially, like, the... the uh, the early uh, like state bureaucracy of the emerging market economies of the American cities. You know, the very first bureaucratic, the bare bones of a bureaucratic state, which is its police and its politicians. And so they got this patronage relationship within the capitalist system to facilitate, you know, the exploitation of the greater number of these, you know, lumpen uh, uh, former peasants. Now the Scotch-Irish, they settled an entirely different pattern. They settled it. They went out into the woods to make their fortune, or more likely, in misfortune, scra scraggling life out of the, 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 the rocks of the Appalachian Mountains. Creating a completely different social structure. W with a different uh, religious, with an entirely different like religious and spiritual uh, like worldview that shaped their relationship to each other. And the project called America. Those are Amber's ancestors, yes. Yes, somebody asked if spiritualism was an upper class theology. And yes, it absolutely was. I mean, these people, these were the heirs of, you know, the Church of England in the United in, in the UK, and like the the old uh, Congregationalist Puritan Church in the United States, and they 
because of their exposure to the most refined elements of you know enlightened urban existence had over time lost their ability to invest traditional religious concepts with meaning and had to invent them out of the whole cloth of like postmodern like uh, or of modern like positivist uh, empirical uh, rationality and science and what emerged out of that was a way to reverse engineer spirituality again in the form of of, uh, of spiritualism and ectoplasm and people pulling fucking uh, gauze out of their mouths. Oh, that's an interesting question. I've thought about some. I love counterfactuals. Somebody asked, what if Nixon had won in 1960 instead of Kennedy? And that is a contingency. That was skin of the teeth. And it did involve theft. Like, that was not made up. And with any of those cases, it, it hangs in the balance. I want to talk about a contingent consequential event. And I've thought about that. And one thing I wonder is, so the Bay of Pigs happened the way it did, because Kennedy got in there with uh, the plan already existing uh, in, uh, God damn, hold on one second. There's doings transpiring. So he inherited, JFK inherited the Bay of Pigs plan from the Eisenhower administration. And he never got the full brief. And uh, the top planners, like Bissell and Wiseman, Wisner, knew the thing wouldn't work without air, air support. But they were afraid of asking, of telling uh, Kennedy that because they were afraid then he would say, well, I'm not going to do it then. They were going to hope that in the moment he would, he would not recognize sunk costs when he saw it and he would decide to overcommit. That was what they were banking on. And he said no. Now, not only was Bay of Pigs planned under the Eisenhower administration, it was under the aegis of the vice president's office. Nixon was Eisenhower's point man for, in the executive branch for the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion. So if he got in there, presumably he would have been more committed to it as policy. Whereas Kennedy never saw it as his baby, was basically willing to let them try it, thinking, hey, this is a low, low cost, low commitment thing. If it doesn't work, we can walk away from it. And then finding, oh no, you can't do that because these guys overcommitted you. Nixon might very well have put the bombers in and maybe the, uh, the foothold is, is a position. Now, I'm not saying they would have won, but you could very easily see a situation where a somewhat successful Bay of Pigs incursion leads to Nixon committing American troops to support it. And instead of having, you know, America's uh, Cold War uh, experience grow hot in Southeast Asia in the mid-60s, it happens in Cuba in the early 60s. Uh, don't know if that's true. I just always thought that was an interesting what if. And basically, you know, the result of that would be that the 60s uh, social ferment and conflict would sort of have sparked early and become more intense. And coupled with the fact that you would not have seen the so I don't think you would have seen the sort of uh, civil rights uh, uh, advancement under Nixon, just because I think that the Southern strategy would have uh, revealed itself, its logic within the greater context of this 
heightened Cold War standoff. You know, like the, the lines would have been more firmly established between the Democrats and Republicans on this question. And as such, uh, the, 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 the coalitions, the political coalitions would be clear. But who knows? I have no idea. We didn't get that world. I'm sorry that took a while. There's people, people are looking at my place. That's why I've been off and on. It's, I thought I, I, I misjudged the time, so I've been kind of riding the lightning here. I'm not moving it yet. It's all in the air. We'll see. We'll see. But I might, be, I might be on the move. We'll see. Yes, we're all going to miss the yard. Uh, yes, I'm going to move to the bunker. I'm going to be moving to a secure facility. Now, I have no idea. Wherever the wind takes me. Pittsburgh is a great town, I have to say. The Paris of Appalachia. I do ever enjoy it. I would go there. I'd get like a disused firehouse and turn it into a podcasting station. I'm getting off, I've been off the beam on meditation, and I think that's contributed to my weird feelings. i got to get back into it. Tomorrow I will uh, get back on the beam, I think. I'm glad someone watched The Ninth Configuration. I'm glad it's a good movie. More people than you should watch it. I gotta actually get into a practice of it. Like, I think I need a group context, but man, not happening now. I mean, it's getting bad. There's gonna be no public anything soon. You're getting to a point where, like, a tipping point where if it's not a full lockdown where you're not like cutting off almost all contact with other people you're basically gonna get it it'd be funny if we, we we reached herd immunity the moment the fucking vaccine came out like oh yeah we just hit we hit 300 million infections and then then the fucking viruses and then the fucking uh the vaccine shows up that'd be perfect we could just all like just have a virus fight with them have a fun little virus fight with the vaccines Owned. I am not blackpilled. Why do people keep saying I am blackpilled? Black pill. The only black pill, in my opinion, is if you ex if you take the conclusion that. You know, the spectacle is self-contained and unbreakable, that participating in it is the surrendering of your soul to a sterile uh, phantom tango that just drains your life essence and leaves you incapable 
of, of fulfilling your human destiny as a fucking self-directed agent of your own interests and the interests of those you love. And you go, yeah, that's all there is. Since this is that what it, that, since that what this is, well, then I'm just going to spend all my time here thinking I'm the damn Joker. Instead of thinking, oh, I can disengage from this. Nothing is actually making me be here. And maybe the things that seem hopeless when I'm stuck my head into this hornet's nest are not, if not fixable, something I can do about it. There's actually something I could fucking do about it. And at least something that can make me feel like I'm standing up for myself and for my fellow human fucking beings. And that cannot be black-pilled. That is hope-pilled. That's love-pilled. Red blood-pilled. The real red pill. The blood of the red of the communist flag is blood. Got hot blood running in my veins. And if you have hot blood, then this will never be enough for you. So the black pill is saying, yes, I will steaden myself spiritually. I will try to just continue to seek an ever, ever intensifying, an, an, a need to ever be intensifying uh, uh, emotional engagement from this disgusting pantomime, this, this performance, this spectacle, this, this engagement as, as a social ritual. That's, that's black, man. That's saying, yeah, I've given up hope. And like, that is black pill. And I say, you can only do that if you have forsaken the world outside of the hornet's nest. Well, the apocalypse has already happened, someone says. I think that in a real sense, like, being human is coming to terms with mortality individually, but then also socially and, and civilizationally and existentially. And, you know, even though we don't know how the human race will end, it will, you know, and every formation that humans take is going to at some point end, including all the ones that we think of as eternal. And part of living is accepting, like, the realities of the trajectory of, of of life and instead of fighting them uh, coming to terms in a way that allows you to live within them like a good example of that for me is we live in a situation where our politics are dead and, f and frozen in this cult sterile culture war because the underlying presumption of politics which we have all been operating on since the fucking cold war uh, about what the government does about what uh, we can, we, what our relationship with government is in terms of its, you know, uh, is gone. It, uh, is, it doesn't actually pertain. Like, the government is not going to provide us with the justice that we assume it will. And so our participating in the system is, uh, is sterile. And so, oh man, I don't know what I was saying. Yep. Yeah, it's sterile. Oh, I forgot what I was saying. God damn it. Oh well. Nah, uh, my brain just died. My brain just uh, skidded out, just exploded. Yeah, civilizations are cyclical until they, like, power up, basically. Like, the cycles continue, but things change as the cycles move. And the accumulation of those changes eventually create a, a phase shift and a new thing.
Now I remember what I was going to say. If we accepted that the New Deal consensus is dead, that the idea that the government can just distribute us all the profits from this huge capitalist system that is bestriding the world and which no longer persists that way, and that we are just like eating our civilizational like heart out in order to provide profits for a system that cannot provide what we think it can, what even like the social democratic dreams of Bernie cannot be if they allow capitalism to remain intact. If we accepted those terms, that reality, that point of no return, then we could address the moment with clarity and move from those, those, those uh, priors. And I think those priors lead towards an engagement with capitalism, like an actual engagement with capitalism and profit. Like a socialization of these, these like uh, marketized lives that we've lived. And that would only be possible if we accepted the death of that stage of American like civic uh, understanding and political economy. Like it's like it was 19, you know, it, it started with the great, uh, it, like start, you want to start it with, with the inauguration of FDR from 33 to 79. And that was it. And now we have to do something else. But it accepts limitations. It accepts that some things are not, not the same that they've ever been, and they can't be that way again. And we have to start, start building from something new. And that the only place that we can uh, find what we were looking for here is not by growing the pie, it's by reclaiming control of how we distribute this thing. Because my God, we have the resources, but they are apportioned the way they are so that situations for commerce can be conducted within them. The thing that's supposed to signal us where everything should go, the price signal conducted by the market. We need it there, but we don't fucking need it there. Amazon, I think, has proven pretty conclusively that we don't. We have private enterprises that are the size of small governments and sometimes mid-sized governments that operate with no price signal and are able to distribute some sort of uh, you know, resource. We can do that, but it means cutting out the entire class of people who stand within these, uh, this smaller and smaller group of people who live to just stand within these uh, uh, transactions and just passively accumulate power and wealth as the rest of us by necessity, because there's less and less to give around, fight over less and less. So that's what I mean when I say, you know, sometimes coming to terms with things doesn't lead you to black pill. It leads you to real uh, effective action because you can see more clearly. You can see clearly now the rain is gone. You can see all obstacles in your way, or at least more than you could. They're coming for me. They're coming for me. Come friendly bombs and rain on slough. It isn't fit for humans now. I'm going to read that. I'm going to sign off here, but first I'm going to read Come Friendly Bombs by John Benjamin. Famously read by Ricky Gervais on, uh, on The Office. Trying to find this thing. Patience. It's not coming. The fuck? I can't find the goddamn thing. I'm Googling this wrong. Oh, it's called Slough. Oh, that's embarrassing. That's like when, uh, that's like when people think that, uh, that uh, that weaker than song, one great city, is actually called "I Hate Winnipeg" because that's the that's the chorus. Very embarrassing. It's called Slough. Come, friendly bombs, and fall on Slough. It isn't fit for humans now. There isn't grass to graze a cow. Swarm over death. Come, bombs, and blow to smithereens those air-conditioned bright canteens. Tinned fruit, tinned meat, tinned milk, tinned beans, tinned mines, tinned breath. Mess up the mess, they call a town, a house for 97 down, and once a week a half a crown for 20 years. 
and get that man with double chin who will always cheat and always win, who washes his repulsive skin in woman's tears, and smash his desk of polished oak, and smash his hands so used to stroke, and stop his boring little joke, and make him yell. But spare the bald young clerks who add the profits of the stinking cad. It's not their fault that they are mad. They've tasted hell. It's not their fault they do not know the bird song from the radio. It's not their fault they often go to Maidenhead and talk of sports and makes of cars and various bogus Tudor bars and daren't look up and see the stars and belt, but belch instead. In labor saving homes with care, their wives frizz out peroxide hair and dry it in synthetic air and paint their nails. Come friendly bombs and fall on slough to get it ready for the plow. The cabbages are coming now. The earth exhales. That's, uh, that was written in 1937, and it basically presaged the eventual and inevitable split uh, after the working class you know, uh, political movement stalled out in its you know, development of, of self-articulation that would inevitably emerge within like, the greater uh, 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 progressive coalition that, made, that the Democratic Party was between its urban, uh, uh, educated, uh, progressive base and its working class, um, less educated base. Right then and there, right? That, that song. Like, because all the stuff he's describing, all those horrors, that's what the Labor Party had fought, was fighting for. That's what, that's what the Democratic Party in the United States is fighting for. And there is an inherent tension there that, uh, is part and parcel to the overall effectiveness of the capitalist response to growing uh, labor militancy at the heart of empire, which was to buy it off, which it could in the United States, especially after World War II. Establish the conditions to allow them to do that. Yeah, they were bought. Well, the thing is, they were bought off in the UK, but they were bought off. I would say the 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 UK they made a better deal. I think those quarter those quarter acre lots. I don't think they stack up to like the NHS and social housing, and I certainly don't think that in the coming times of like full collapse, I think those things are going to hold together a little better for people and make those lives better than here, where already like that that uh, uh, that has already turned a mess. Of, a mess of pottage because the buying off in Europe involved like actual infrastructure you know redistributive infrastructure of the state in the US it mostly boiled down to uh, uh, you know first it was it was in it was income in the form of you know ever-increasing paychecks which is what contributed to this to the to the inflation of the late 60s and 70s uh, and then when that wouldn't sustain itself anymore and they re, re, they broke the back of the labor movement and its ability to demand more for its uh, constituents replace it with credit and that's all we have now is just credit massive massive amounts of credit which really makes me think that if there is any hope to like stabilizing the system in capitalism's favor in the near term, it's going to involve some sort of debt cancellation, some mass debt cancellation, just getting numbers off the books because they could do it and not doing it is causing more than anything, even more than COVID, which you could solve for this like gasping and cranking and, and wheezing of the of the like consumer economy, the demand, the demand uh, leg of the fucking uh, engine here, the piston. But no, like it will not be the, the reason it will be that is because. That's just putting num moving numbers around on a paper, and more importantly, it's a one-time thing. All it really does is allow is give you a chance to get more credit, so you can keep it going. I'm not saying that it would be bad if people got that; it would help them live a little more dangerously. Maybe make them more amenable to doing something politically that they wouldn't do since their lives, since that debt was so heavy around their neck. Maybe people who are would be afraid to organize in a whole workplace because they had a lot of student debt or or credit card debt if they went that route which they absolutely should fuck student debt i mean yes student debt but credit card debt too and medical debt as a no-brainer i mean nobody even expects to get that shit like that stuff is pennies on the dollar already fractions of pennies on the dollar that should all go like but i'm saying is that even if, it, if that ends up being it as good as that'll be uh over time 
the, the old patterns will reassert themselves because the distribution mechanism has not changed at all. But that might be what we get out of Biden. And that would be, I will say this, that will be a best case scenario because there's nothing in the government, there's nothing in the Democratic Party, there's nothing in the dynamic here to push anybody to the left. It can't realistically be said to happen, I don't think. People talk about protests and stuff, but I mean, I just don't under, I don't see the, the organizational capacity to make them effective. Especially since there's going to be a massive downward pressure on mobilization now that Biden's in. A lot of people are going to want to just relax for a while. And as people have said, go to brunch. Go to brunch. Will you go to brunch? Claire Gary Glenn Ross. Will you go to brunch? So I don't know. But I'd say if they do go with that, that's the smartest thing they could do just to keep some, keep, in terms of keeping the economy going. But really what it'll be is it'll be just, it'll be an, a, a boot up. And that's, if that's what happens, then by God, don't, do not, uh, what is it? Do not light a candle to curse your darkness, whatever the hell it is. If it emerges, do not just be like, this is bullshit and complain about it. Hey, embrace it and move forward with it. Just saying, do not take it as a sign that the winds are shifting in any good direction. If it happens though, use that, exa- use that time, use that ability, use that breath. To, to reassert your life, to reassess. Put the mimosa down. Mimosas are for closers only. Has anyone ever done this before? It seems like this should have been done like years ago. Glen, like uh, Lib Glengarry Glen Ross. These are the posts. These are the Glengarry call out posts. To you, these posts are gold. And you don't get them. Nice guy, don't give a shit. Good father, fuck you and get political quotes from your kids. All right, guys. I'm going. Sorry about the uh, interruptions today. That won't happen again. And I hope the audio issues were cleared up. I'll just stick with the microphone. Hopefully, Chris can boost the sound for the YouTubes. I don't know what the problem is there, but we'll work on it. Bye-bye.